With new updates comes new places, and today, I want to dive into the potential locations that we can find in Genshin Impact's future based on lore. If you didn't already know, Genshin Impact's nations and inspirations are based on our world and cultures. And today, I want to see if I can give an eagle eyes perspective of what each location might look like. Disclaimer, this is all just a personal theory and is not indicative of any final product. I'm not an expert in geography and cultures, meaning I will be judging most, if not all, the locations with real-life parallels using a generalized perspective. This was a blatant excuse for me to make a Mara Javari video. The areas in Genshin Impact are categorized in two ways, main nations like Mondstadt and Liyue, and their respective supplementary areas like Dragonspine. I'll also be going over the actual location and topography instead of focusing on the cultures itself. Determining a time frame for Genshin Impact's inspirations is often difficult, but it is fair to assume that most of the architecture predates the modern styles we are aware of since we can countercheck Mondstadt, Leo, and Inazuma. So architectural references are going to be guesswork on my end, but has to follow a consistent theme throughout the time periods. So let's begin. Sumeru has potential inspirations from the civilization of Sumer from Mesopotamia and the Middle East. I was initially considering if Sumeru was going to be only Indian cultures, but then I also realized that a lot of architecture that we do see in the manga has references outside of that country. In the game, we are told that Sumeru has tropical climates and is known for having both deserts and forests. The god of the woods used to preside over the land, and when they died, the grass and trees never spoke again. It's possible that the sands and deserts of Sumeru may have come from the god of woods' death as a result of magical climate change, but that's just a potential theory. We actually do see glimpses of Sumeru cities in the manga. The area presented to us is in a desert, and the houses resemble a lot of the traditional Islamic Arab houses we find in media. These houses are made of hand-formed baked bricks and have intricate wooden weaves integrated into their doors, windows, and jealousy. Windows tend to protrude outward, and these are called Masharabiya according to Wikipedia. It was used to catch wind and jars and basins would be placed over for cooling the interior. The style itself was influenced by Roman, Byzantine, Persian, and Mesopotamian architecture. It's possible we'll see several buildings like mosques, tombs, and even citadels as exploration areas. What's fascinating though is that Sumeru has both forests and desert biomes. By extension, that means we can make several guesses what the Sumeru Academia and other important locations look like. The Sumeru Academia is known to be the most prestigious school in all of the continent, and my guess is that it resembles the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, the outside at least. A large building with pillars and a dome ceiling would fit well with the aesthetic of an amazing and prestigious academy, as we see with other fictional schools of that caliber that basically resemble a fortress. Additionally, I can see the Great Library of Alexandria, which was one of the most significant libraries in the ancient world, being a reference for its interior. Tall shelves and narrow walkways along the edge, the interior will also be filled with pillars of sorts and high ceilings. But there's also an alternative form of architecture that I think large fortresses in Sumeru can hold. In the manga, we see a fortress in Sumeru that resembles the stereotypical castles that we see in fantasy worlds. But this castle looks wide and has several layers of windows and teeth like bricks running down along the towers. There are a lot of great forts in India that resemble this kind of architecture. Their walls are lined with several small windows and lined bricks that keep the design of the exterior really busy. But that's just architecture. I do have some ideas what Sumeru can have based on other more fantastical elements. First is the aspect of Dendro. It's possible we'll be getting another form of environmental effect similar to the Tatarugami. Dendro is an element known for manipulating damage over time like poison and burning. We'll most likely get an area in the forest that is very similar to that. There is an entity also known as the Deev that poisoned Kalei when she was younger, and the Deev are known to be malicious creatures, meaning that it's possible we'll also get that kind of Tatarugami area somewhere along the forest. Second is on the theme of trees. We might be getting something akin to the Tree of Knowledge in Sumeru. The domain trees are known to have collected information from across decades. Having one in Sumeru to be studied may be a fascinating design. As for the more forest-like sides of Sumeru, that much I'm not sure where they'll get the information from. It's possible they'll still incorporate the architecture of the old Sumerian civilizations into the more forest-like parts of the ruins.
The chasm is a place that we've been teased with all the way from 1.3. It's a sub-area in Lisha that is connected to the Abyss. It was formed after a meteorite hit Teyvat 6,000 years ago. The chasm was once a popular site for miners because of its abundance of ores, but after the cataclysm, the area is now populated by monsters. According to NPCs, the climate has changed terribly and the Millilith and an unnamed Yaksha was last seen fighting the monsters. So let's begin with the actual location. In translation, it's also known as the huge abyss of stratified rock and Great Canyon. Stratified rocks look much different from your normal mountains and look really, really dope. The rocks themselves form consistent lines along the ridges of the rock and a whole canyon of this would look amazing. But now I want to discuss the more abyssal part of the location. The climate being referred to may be in reference to a corrosion. I feel like because this was what also disturbed Ashtaha's seals, it's possible this might be connected to an effect that will cause NPCs to go berserk and have empowered defenses like the Tatsurigami. We'll probably have a side quest that purifies the area much like Sayuri Island. Also, it's possible that whatever hints we are getting from the Rifthounds will extend to the chasm. We'll probably see more monsters that have a rock-like aesthetic of the hounds since it'll fit a great canyon-esque location. The Dark Sea is the vast expanse of the realm outside of Teyvat. This is where fallen gods ran to after the Archon War and is known to be a wasteland. In game, we are aware that Orobashi came from this place, and that Enkanomiya and Watatsumi Island may have been connected to the sea. We know little about the Dark Sea civilization, but we do know it'll have somewhat of an active civilization. That's because the people of Wadatsumi Island used to come from that place, meaning there will at least be settlements. More folk are also present in the Dark Sea, so we'll see another subspecies of human like Sucrose or Diona's races. The Dark Sea, as you would have guessed, is very dark, so having external light sources like the mechanic we see in Seiri Island is very possible. We might even use the coral technique that Urobashi used for the Watatsumi people. But what I do want to connect more closely to this was the area also outside of the Seven's Domain known as the Kingdom of the Seelies. In the book known as The Drunkard's Tale, a lone wolf king found himself in a barren wasteland. He passed through the domains of monsters and seelies, and the wasteland is beyond the dominion of the Seven. According to the book, it was once inhabited by the grotesque. In the land was the palace of the seelies. Seelies were once a mighty race that guided mankind. The palaces were grey and there would be overgrown weeds in the halls. He passed an old sarcophagus and a portrait of a deceased ruler. It was there he met the fair maiden who was singing songs. She had ashen skin and long hair. It's not known whether this land is even real or otherwise, but it's always safe to assume that in Genshin Impact, when something's known as legends in mythology, it's probably real. We know that Seelies are real, and we know that the Dark Sea is real, so maybe in the future we'll get to learn more about the Seelies by going into their domain. It's unknown how to enter the domain itself since the Wolf King said he ventured far outside of Tebat. The Mara Devara is a location mentioned by Stan Lee during the Carmen Day questline and the Lava Walker artifact set. It is known as a domain located near a desert that connects the opposite end of Mondstadt. The Lava Walker entered the Mara Devara by going into a sea of lava. The location itself is known for its scalding atmosphere and sea of ashes and fire. It's possible that the Mara Javari will be used like how the Golden Arch Archipelago was used in the past. The Mara Javari may be filled with volcanoes and other igneous rocks. It also had the title in other translations as the Geyser Realm, so we'll most likely get random bursts of hot lava liquids that work like the lightning environmental effect in Inazuma. What we do know is that the Mara Javari has burning sand, external scorch, extremely high temperatures, a flaming sea, and that time seems to flow differently. It was known as a domain and that the winds do not pass through the Mara Javari, but in the Lava Walker set, it is said that the sage stayed there for 100 years. If I had to guess, other than being inspired by French cultures, it was also inspired by the late 19th century all the way to the Roaring Twenties or the Année Folle since we're going into the French culture. This decade emphasized the era's social, artistic, and cultural dynamism where the popular Great Gatsby motif existed. Fontaine is known for being technologically advanced in terms of lifestyle. They created the camera, the film, and other steampunk inventions that assisted other nations, like Inazuma's Jokotsu Mine. Additionally, Fontaine may be inspired by clockwork and steampunk aesthetics while being mixed with the classic Great Gatsby vibe of wild theaters, jazz, and blinding lights. Fontaine is also known as the hub of cultures and the arts. 
In terms of architecture, I can see Fontaine being a hybrid of two popular kinds, Beaux-Arts and Neoclassicism. Beaux-Arts is a Parisian style that resembles elaborate and refined buildings. It focused on porticos, pavilions, sculptures, symmetry, domes, and elaborate windows. If the court of Fontaine would be anything to go off on, I would say this architecture would impose the mighty and firm justice system the country would try to portray. I'm imagining large white buildings with lots of pillars and balconies since this is the nation of justice. I don't think that Fontaine is going to be as modernized as we think it would be. Even with their steampunk and industrial revolutions, I think they're going to be much more traditional in terms of aesthetic to fit Teyvat's overall theme. What we do know, however, is that they potentially have airships and a monorail system. In the game, we know from an Inazuma side quest where we look for a travel guide that there was a time a person created an air balloon and traveled around Teyvat for 80 days. This may be a reference to the popular book called Around the World in 80 Days, written by the French writer Jules Venner and was first published in 1872. In a land of hydro, having glass around to mimic the theme of reflection and transparency would fit it rather well. And it would be cool to see Genshin's own inspiration of the underground triangular museum that houses the Mona Lisa. An underwater city of Fontaine would also be a cool addition if they ever go through that with the glass architecture, but I can see a lot of difficulties for exploration if they incorporate an underwater city. Though I'm hopeful at least, but it's safest to bet that the most we'll be getting are just some underwater passages and canals. Natlan is the city that we have the least information about. Unfortunately, this means we'll be grasping at straws when it comes to architecture and references, but we can try our best at least. Let's begin with the geography and topography. Natlan is known to be the nation of Pyro and might be taking references from the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Pacific Ring of Fire is known as a geological area along the Pacific Ocean that is characterized by active volcanoes and earthquakes. Additionally, I think Natlan might be a mountainous archipelago, something like the Philippines. As for Natlan's architecture and buildings, we might get references to the Aztec architecture. The reason for this is that Natlan might have references to Mesoamerica given its namesake and character motifs during the trailer. The word Natlan might come from a language known as Nahuatl, and in Aztec mythology, the word Aztec comes from Aztlan. This means that since the Pyro Archon is the god of war, coliseums and arenas are prevalent. You'll have numerous festivals held in wide areas surrounded by pyramids, temples, plazas, and homes. Tall pyramids with wide areas are meant for battle, sacrifice, and festivities, since Venti says the Pyro Archon always celebrates victories in her name. As for the settlements, according to Vanessa, the people are nomadic. We might get a grand central temple for the Pyro Archon herself, but the usual settlements would consist of tents and wooden huts. As for other mechanical effects, if I'm right that the Marriage of Ara is the precursor to Natlan in terms of introducing new mechanics, the Marriage of Ara's increasing heat damage over time would carry over to Natlan. So that's annoying. Snezhnaya is a land inspired by Russian influences with a hint of Italian customs. Snezhnaya itself in game is freezing, so we'll be looking at Dragon Spine for its environmental effects. There are two parts to Snezhnaya that I will consider. First is the main city that the Tsaritsa will reign over. The palace mentioned in the game houses the nine Fatui Harbingers and might be a reference to the Winter Palace from Russia. According to Wikipedia, the Winter Palace is a palace in St. Petersburg that is the official residence of the Russian emperors from 1732 and until 1917. Should there be a main city? It's possible that Snezhnaya's location follows the Imperial Russia architecture. This style of architecture was popular from 1712 all the way to 1917 and brought several locations like the Catherine Palace and Smolny Cathedral. This style of architecture is one of the more popular ones depicted in media, where you see this strange rounded pinched ceiling atop tall towers. It's a style reserved for Russian inspirations in most video games and other forms of media, so it would fare well to differentiate Snezhnaya from other nations. However, it's also possible that Snezhnaya is a fortress. After all, Snezhnaya is the most technologically advanced nation in terms of militaristic power. Snezhnaya, according to Alice, was also filled with factories, meaning we're approaching a more industrialized nation rather than something like Mondstadt or Liyue. Snezhnaya also has a lot of underground facilities, and with harbingers like the Tore, tunnels and internal workshops and laboratories may be part of our exploration. But another part of Snezhnaya is the coastal areas. Mereposok is known as a fishing village, meaning that Snezhnaya might have a large body of water connected to it. 
Ajax was also known to ice fish as a child, and when a harbinger accompanied Kunikuzushi to Snezhnaya, they did it by boat. It's possible that Snezhnaya is at the end of the continent and not in the center. Kind of like Mondstadt in terms of geology. With the climate, we might be getting cool ice oceans too, and large mountains. When I consider what this might be like, I'm thinking that the more outskirts of Snezhnaya are akin to Siberia. Siberia is known for its vast mountain ranges and wilderness, and as a child, Ajax did run into the forest before falling into the abyss. But yes, those are all my predictions of the future regions in Genshin Impact. I purposefully didn't cover the last three areas that I believe might be added because I want to cover them all in another video. These are Conria, Celestia, and the Abyss. But what do you guys think? This was just a chiller video because I've been covering a lot of demon and religious stuff lately, that I wanted to go back to my roots. I think it's great Genshin Impact is getting references from real life stuff. But nevertheless, my name is Aster and thank you for chilling with me. Happy Holidays!